Okay, so the request is 2015B26 in the, in that exam. And the question asks, what is the absolute max and min? Yes, it wasn't four, it was three. Okay. Yep. Okay, so for this question it says f of x is ln of x minus one half x squared on what's what's messed up about this question is that they give you a transcendental function in ln of x with bounds, endpoints e to the negative 1 and e squared. So I think most of the compl most of the complication of dealing with this question is working with log, working with log of these numbers. Okay, for global max and global min, we do not make number lines. That's not what the strategy is for, for calculating the, the locations of global max and global min. The, the strategy is we look for global max and min in the interior, which means finding critical points get from taking the derivative and setting the derivative equal to zero and solving for x. And then we check the value of the original function at the critical points, and we check the value of the original function at the endpoints, and then rank and compare all the y values. Okay, so first step, take the derivative. The derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. The derivative of 1 half x squared, the 2 comes down, cancels with the 2 that's downstairs, we just get minus x. And then set the derivative equal to zero and solve. Add x to both sides. So x is equal to one over x. And multiply both sides by x. So x squared is equal to one. And it looks like we get two solutions. We get x is equal to one, and x is equal to minus one. But the negative solution doesn't count. It's not inside the domain of the function. You can't take the log of a negative number. The graph of f of x does not exist for x equals negative 1, so it doesn't count. Next, we have three values to test the derivative at. We want to test, the, not the derivative, the original function. We want to test the original function at 1. We want to test the original function at e to the power of negative 1. And we want to test the original function at e squared to see which one has the highest y value and which one has the lowest y value. Okay, if we plug 1 into the original function, we'll have ln 1 minus 1 half of 1 squared. Ln of 1 is 0, and 1 squared is 1, so we have 0 minus a half, which is negative 1 half. If we plug e to the negative 1 into the function, we'll have the ln of e to the negative 1 minus 1 half of e to the negative 1 all squared. Ln of e to the negative 1, that's a cancellation law, they're inverse functions, so we're left with negative 1. And that's minus 1 half multiplied by e to the negative 1 squared is e to the negative 2, which is 1 over e squared. So this doesn't clean up much. This is minus 1 minus 1 over 2 e squared. Which is more negative than negative 1 half. You have minus 1, which is more negative than negative 1 half, and then you're subtracting the number. So it's making that even more negative. So if, if it's a battle for absolute min between those two, the second one is going to win that battle. Now we plug in e squared, ln of e squared minus 1 half of e squared. Ln of e squared again, we get a cancellation law, we just have the 2 minus e squared over 2. Now we come to the hard part, ranking them. In most examples, it's easy to rank them. You're comparing negative 5 to positive 3. 
which one's the biggest, which one's the smallest. But here all the numbers are, or well, two of the numbers are screwed up. The easiest way to compare screwed up numbers is to compare with equal denominator. So I'm going to put all three numbers in a, in a row. We have negative one half. This is not in any particular order. I don't know what the order is. We're going to find that, find that out. Minus one minus one over two e squared. And then the last one, two minus e squared over two. So let's simplify each of these in, in line. first one doesn't simplify, it doesn't just stays a, as it is. The second one, let's bring everything in that expression to a common denominator. That will be minus, so multiply top and bottom of, of the first expression by 2e squared, so we'll have negative 2e squared divided by 2e squared minus 1 over 2e squared. That will be negative bracket e squared plus 1 divided by 2e squared. Now we'll do the same for this second. Bring that to a common denominator. Multiply top and bottom of the first piece by 2. So a 4 over 2 minus e squared over 2. And that's going to be 4 minus e squared all over 2. And then let's bring this one to the same denominator. Multiply top and bottom by e squared. We'll have negative e squared divided by 2 e squared. And the third one, we'll bring that one to the same denominator. Multiply top and bottom by e squared. We'll have 4 minus e squared times e squared all divided by 2 e squared. That was just death. Sorry, what happened? Well, once they all have the same denominators, then we just try the numerators. So now we're comparing. So same denominators. So now we're comparing negative e squared to negative bracket 2e squared plus 1 to 4 minus e squared times e squared. Okay, what's e? e is around 2.7. So we'll do some estimating. This is, this is approximately equal to two, negative bracket 2.7 squared. If it was 3 squared, it would be 9. 2.7 squared will be between 4 and 9. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. So somewhere in between. You could do 27 times 27 and, and then divide by 100 if you want. There are different ways of, it just depends on what quality estimate, estimate you're looking for. Likewise, for the next one, we would do the same thing. This is approximately equal to negative bracket 2 times 2.7 squared plus 1. Now for the third one, this is 4 minus 2.7 all squared times another 2.7 all squared. So this the squaring of 2.7 becomes really important. It's, in, it's going to be needed for each of these three pieces. The second one will be needed twice. So what's 27 times 27? It's 20 times 27 plus 7 times 27. 
That's how I do multiplication. 20 times 27 plus 7 times 27. 2 times 27 would be 540. Sorry, 54 times 10, 540. Plus 7 times 27 is 7 times 20, which is 140, so plus 189. Yell at me if, this, if I'm screwing this up. We'll have 7 and then there probably is 749 and that means that E squared is approximately 7.49 well let's just say approximately 7.5 I don't know what they did in the book. I, I'm not keen on looking at it. Well, I'm not, not too interested in making sense of this. Oh, they're doing with inequalities. You don't have to do that. If you like inequalities, you can follow it that way. They're saying that E squared is a number that's larger than 4 because E is larger than 2. So if it was 2, 2 squared would give you 4. Something larger than 2 squared has to be larger than 4. And then, and then they, they go from there. Anyway, so we're going to get negative 7.5 from the first one. And from the second one, we'll have negative 2 times 7.5, which is 15 plus 1. That'll be negative 16. And from the third one, We'll have 4 minus 7.5 times 7.5. That's going to be 2.5, negative 2.5 times 7.5. And what's that? So that's negative 5 over 2 multiplied by 15 over 2. And that's going to be negative, that was 4, be negative 75 over 4. If it was 80 over 4, it would be 20. Well, it's close to 16, that's the problem. Five extra, so we're missing five over four, one point two five. So it's a li it's a little bit bigger than than eighteen. I'll just say it's approximately negative eighteen. So you then you compare these y values. The largest is the negative e squared, and that came from x equals what was that? That was x equals one, I think. Yeah. X is equal to 1, so that's your global max. And then this, uh, the, the smallest one, the most negative one, is happening at the other endpoint, the negative 18. That X is equal to e, e squared, global min, most negative Y value. So the calculus part, I think most of the marks, by the time this thing got marked, most of the marks were contained in this part, in identifying what the correct procedure was for, for global max and global min. And the rest of it was marked for fairly generously. If you correctly interpreted what, whatever you had, if you knew what, what it meant to be an absolute max and absolute min, that it meant that the function had the lowest y value, the absolute min, and the highest y value, the absolute max, that you get most of the marks for. That was the way it, it ended up being graded. That's pretty ugly. So the, the, the question that kind of prefaced this was, where was the hard question on last year's exam? I'd say this was one of them, this aspect of, how do you get 100% on the exam? Well, you have, to, you have to answer this question fully. 
it was fairly straightforward to get uh, four out of six marks, I think, but then the other two marks were hard to get. Okay, so the next question. 2010 exam. And nine? Ten. Just ten. Okay, just ten. Ten and eleven. So A10 says integrate sine of the square root of x divided by 2 root of x dx. Okay, this is not on our list. It's almost on our list. It's, it's a sine of x integral, but it has this, this root of x inside. So what we'll do is we'll let u equal what's inside the function. We'll let u equal the square root of x. And see what happens. So du by dx, well that's x to the one half, hold on. du by dx, the one half comes down, power gets reduced by one, x to the negative one half. So du by dx is equal to one half, and root of x goes downstairs now. x to the one half is the same thing as one over the root of x, and you can multiply both the fractions together. Now cross multiply to isolate for dx. So 2 root of x du is equal to dx, and then divide both sides. du is equal to dx divided by, oh no, it's just, just, just get dx all by itself. Just get dx by itself. Okay, so, oh, that's what I wanted. So now we'll replace dx by that expression. So we'll have integral of the sine of u divided by 2 times u times 2u du because this root of x here is also u. It's also what we substituted. Okay, next, cancel. The u top and bottom. You cannot cancel the u that's inside the sign. Pure sin. It's pure sin to do that. That's not my idea. I like it though. Okay. Now the twos cancel as well. So we have integral of sine of u du. Questions to here? So this is integral of sine of u is negative cosine of u plus c. There's no bounds of integration, so there's a, uh, an arbitrary constant. And then last step is replace u in, in terms of its, its x equivalent, so cos to the root of x plus c. Yes. At the end of a good substitution, the entire integral will be rewritten in terms of the new variable only. X and will not appear in it. You know where you put the box? Yes. So it's always going to be the u and then the u. There's no x. Usually in that. Uh, there can be. There can be. But when you plug everything in, it'll cancel. Any, any of the x stuff that survives will cancel with the x stuff that's already there at the beginning. Okay. Do you want to do one like that? show you that it's okay to have. Okay, I'll, I'll make one up. OK, 
Okay. So integral of x squared times e to the power of x cubed dx. It's not on your list. It's close to something on your list. And the only way to get to get a list member from here is to do a substitution. We'll let u equal what's inside the function. So the inside or what is inside e to the power of is x cubed. That's been plugged into the exponential function. We'll calculate the derivative. u by dx is 3x squared. And then isolate for dx. We'll get dx is equal to du divided by 3x squared. And that we'll use to substitute the dx there. So this will become the integral. The x squared that's already there stays. We're not going to change it. x cubed gets replaced by u, so of e to the u. And then the dx gets replaced by du divided by 3x squared. And it's, happy, it's a happy substitution because the x squared on the top cancels with the x squared on the bottom. And the result we're left with does not contain the old variable. It only contains the new variable. Put the constant up front. One third comes in front of this. And we have e to the u du. Questions to this point? What if it was an x to the power 4? Oh. Wouldn't work. <coughs> Substitution wouldn't work. If it was x to the power 4 in front, we, we could not use this approach to integrate the function. When we did the substitution, we would still have an x squared left, which we'd have to rewrite in terms of uh, a power of u. And then we'd have a, a, na a fairly nasty integral that may not even be able to, something that we could solve with, with integration by parts and may require a different strategy. Okay, next step. Sorry? No. Okay, okay. So integral of e to the u is e to the u plus c. And the last step, replace the u with what it is in terms of x, e to the x cubed plus c. Then you have another question. Or no? Yeah. Right. 
Right. But those two values, that second value is from plugging in the endpoints. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? But this C, when, when we have endpoints, we don't get a C. Yeah. So this, this is a different, the fact that this is not being multiplied by the one third is a separate issue. The reason why there's a C here to begin with is if you take the derivative of this expression, the existence of a, of a constant that outside, it just be of the bracket, right? Take the derivative of a constant is zero, so it's something that we have to include as part of the general solution for the interval. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it's multiplied by the, by the constant that's in front of the function doesn't change that. It just makes it a different constant. Yeah? Can you do 12, 14, sure. 12, 14, sure. That's the integral from 0 to root 3 over 2, that one? Twenty twelve A thirteen asks for fourteen or thirteen? Fourteen. Okay. A fourteen asks for the integral from zero to root three over two of dt divided by the root of one minus t squared dt. Okay, this is one of your memorized integrals. You know that if h of x is equal to arc sine of x, then h prime is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we have that as one of the derivatives that you have to memorize. And having that derivative memorized tells you what the antiderivative of 1 over 1 Oh, thank you. No second DT there. Oh, oh damn. Why is that there? It shouldn't be there. It should only be one. That's a typo. I just blindly copied it, just like everyone else in the room. And then I, then I, I just avoided it, avoided the issue. No, it shouldn't be there. It's, it's a legit typo. It can happen. Typos like that can happen. If it happens. <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. If you have two d's, like a dt and a dw, or a dx and a dy, you need a second interval. You need a double interval, or a triple interval, or a triple interval. Those exist, but if there's a single interval and there's no implied multi multivariable integration, you can only have one differential. Okay, so this is going to be arc sine of t evaluated from 0 to root 3 over 2. So this is arc sine of root 3 over 2 minus arc sine of 0. I'm going to draw a triangle. Thirty, sixty, ninety triangle. So we have pi over six, pi over three. Across from pi over six is one. Across from the pi over three is a root three. Pythagorean theorem gives you the hypotenuse as two. Now you're looking for this, the angle such that its sine is root three over two. That's what this is asking for. The sine of what mystery angle gives you? So this is pi over 3, and then arc sine of 0, the sine of what angle is 0? Not 0, sine of 0 is 0, so we get an answer of pi over 3. Questions about this one?
looks like, and it is the same thing as the derivative of the Marx equation. Okay, so Just as a, as a, as a reminder, okay. uh, this is why the antiderivative of 1 over 1 minus x squared is Marx and x, because the derivative of Marx and x is 1 over 1 minus x squared. You don't have to memorize the integral separately, you can memorize the derivative. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. Yep. 12? Sure. Okay. Well, that's a, a cute way to solve it. I'm not going to solve it that way. So it's 2012, number 12. It asks for the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i over n. So this looks like the limit as n approaches infinity of delta x times the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i. It's a general form of, of a, a Riemann sum. We can convert into a Riemann integral. Integral from a to b of f of x dx. Where delta x is b minus a over n and f of x sub i or rather x sub i is a plus i delta x. So the fact that there's no bracket 2 plus i over n n bracket, the fact that there's no single number being added to this expression that looks like i delta x means that a is 0. Right. And this 1 over n thing, this could be inside here. Yeah. The reason why it doesn't matter where it is, is this piece is independent of the index i. So it's like a constant as far as the sum is concerned. You can move it in and out. It's like you can move, you can move three, a constant of 3 in and out of the sum. Okay, so the fact that this thing's missing means that a is equal to 0. So the next piece is from the delta x. Delta x is 1 over n, and it has to equal b minus 0 over n. That means that b is equal to 1. n's cancel, b is equal to 1. So this sum can be converted into the integral from a to b, from 0 to 1, of the function f of x dx. What's the function? Well, this thing here, I think of the sum, that is x sub i. Well, that's f of x sub i, which is just x sub i. So f of x is just x. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of x dx. If we're asked for a related question, what if, this is kind of a new question, limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of the tan of i over n. So i over n is still going to be x sub i, but then f of x sub i would be the tan of x sub i. So f of x would be the tan of x. But nothing's being done to that x sub i. 
no, no function is modifying it. It's not being squared. It's not being cube rooted. It's not being hit with the sine of x. It's not being hit with the sine function or cosine function. It's just x. Questions about this aspect before I keep going? Take the antiderivative. Antiderivative of x is one half x squared. And we evaluate that from zero to one. So that'll be one half of one squared minus one half of zero squared, which is one half times one minus one half times zero, which is an answer of one half. Three hours. I have to turn off my microphone to answer that question. So d squared y by dx squared. D squared y by dx squared is the fancy way of writing the derivative of y with respect to x twice. Y double prime, second derivative. That means the same. No, it's it's saying it's dy. It's saying d by dx. It's almost like this. You're saying take the operator, the derivative operator, square it, and hit y with that new operator, and that's where the d squared y by dx. I like to call it y double prime though. It's just cleaner notation. Okay, this means we have to find y prime and then take the derivative, the derivative again. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of y squared is 2 times y times y prime because y is a function of x. So it's like if you have f of x all squared and take its derivative, the two would come down. You know, f of x to the power of 1 multiplied by the derivative of the inside for the chain rule, multiplied by x prime. So instead of x, we have y. You, you do that whenever you have a function of y. So uh, here's an aside. So not connected to this. Say so you have sine of x plus sine of y is equal to x plus y. So a disconnected question has, has nothing to do with this, not directly. And we're asked for y prime. We're asked to find the derivative. So find y prime. We'll take the derivative of, of all the pieces of this. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. What's the derivative of sine of y? Uh, Cos of y. Right, dy by d, or, or cos of y times y prime. Imagine if this was the cosine of x squared. Or it's just cosine of x squared. Oh, uh, uh, okay. It doesn't differentiate the chain rule. It's the sine of x squared. You have cos of x squared multiplied by x. But we don't know what the function is. It's just called y. So the best that we can do, if we don't know what y prime is, And on the right hand side, we have the derivative of x, which is 1, plus the derivative of y, which again, the best we can do for the derivative of y is to call it y prime. And then we would rearrange and isolate for y prime. 
So that's why this one up here in red is the same kind of same kind of format. We're taking the derivative of the function squared. Two comes down. We have the original function one lower power, so power one, multiplied by the derivative of the inside from the chain rule, multiplied by y prime. And that equals the derivative of one on the right hand side, which is zero. Okay, next step. Bring the 2y, y prime to the other side. So 2y, y prime is equal to 2x. The 2's cancel. Isolate for y prime. y prime is equal to x divided by y. How do you find y double prime? What method do you need? Yeah, you take the derivative again. What method do you have for the derivative on the right-hand side? Quotient. So this is the top function over bottom function. Y double prime. Yes, or you could do a product rule with y to the power of negative 1. Either way. They're, they're both good. So y double prime will be bt prime minus tb prime over b squared. That's going to be the bottom function, which is y. Multiply by the derivative of the top, the derivative of x is 1, minus the top function, which is x, multiply by the derivative of the bottom, the derivative of y is y prime, all divided by y squared. So this is going to be y minus xy prime, all over y squared. Now we need to evaluate this at x equals, what was it, 2 and y is equal to root 3. So this will be root 3 minus 2y prime divided by root 3 squared. We have a problem. We don't have y prime. y prime at 2 comma root 3. So we have to go back up to a previous line. Let's go back up to here. So y prime was x divided by y. And that means if we plug in 2 for x, root 3 for y, we'll have 2 divided by root 3. And that gets plugged in here for y prime. Questions to here? So this is going to be root 3 minus 2 times 2 over root 3. And then root 3 squared is 3. So this will be, we need to make a common denominator to combine those two terms. Multiply top one with this by root 3. We'll have root 3 times root 3 over root 3 minus 4 over root 3 all divided by 3 that'll be 3 minus 4 over root 3 divided by 3 be minus 1 over root 3 multiplied by 1 third which is minus 1 over 3 root 3 and yeah, and that's what I have. y prime is equal to x from there.
square plus over one. And if you plug in the stuff in here, you get the same result. You bring the common denominator of y over y squared, and combine them, you get the same thing. It's the third, plus the third set of four. So y minus x by prime multiplied by y squared. one multiple choice question, but mm, there's a few of those that are a lot of steps. Next one. Okay, so 2015, A19, it's, it says the integral from x cubed to x squared of f of t dt is equal to 2. Integral from 0 x cubed of f of t dt is equal to 3 and it wants integral from x squared to 0 of f of t dt. Okay. I'm going to write some rules of integration. One rule of integration is the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals the negative integral from b to a of f of x dx. If you switch the bounds of integration, the integral picks up a minus sign. Another rule is the integral from a to b can be written as the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b for c equals anything, anything you want. If you're looking for the area under a curve, for let's say from 0 to 10, you can find the area from 0 to 3, find the area from 3 to 10, and then that will come together put up your journey at any point in the middle of the integral. And there's some, well, there's some conditions attached to this. You can get into conditions on a function as well as a between a and b between the endpoints, not having any problems. Sometimes if the function has problems in the middle, say it has a vertical, um, a vertical, asym a vertical asymptote, a place where the function explodes, integrating from a to b might be okay depending on how we define that, that integral. But integrating only up to and including the vertical asymptote could be a problem. We could get a divergence that's not corrected or compensated from the other side. So there's all kinds of issues that, that are lurking behind these properties that we didn't get into because the kinds of functions we're working with are nice functions. Anyway, we have to use these properties, these two properties, to solve this question. First property is we'll write the integral from x cubed to x squared. We'll write that as the integral from x cubed to 0 plus the integral from 0 to x squared. 
and then, or hold on, let's not do that. Sorry, I'm gonna go back, I lied. We're gonna use the other property first. We'll write this as the negative integral from x squared to x cubed. That's a bit easier. We'll flip the bounds and put a minus sign in front. I'm doing that to make it look like the two pieces that we have. They're going from 0 to x cubed, so it has the x cubed on top, and then go from x squared to 0, and then from the bottom. So now this has the right order, ordered it in, in the correct way. Then we'll write this as the negative bracket integral from x squared to 0 plus integral from 0 to x cubed. On the left hand side we still have integral from x cubed to 2. x squared. I mean. Questions to here. Here is 2 equals negative bracket integral from x from 0 to x cubed is 3 and what we want I'll call w. what? So, multiply both sides by negative 1. We'll have negative 2 is equal to what we want plus 3. And then subtract 3 from both sides. So negative 5 equals what we want. Minus x squared. Yep. Y equals x squared. X equals negative 3 and x is equal to positive 3. Okay. So we'll start with a sketch. Well, actually, well, that's a lie. We'll start with checking where to see where the two functions cross. This is 5, no, this is 6.1 number something. So check for crossing points. Eight minus x squared is equal to x squared. Add x squared to both sides, so eight is equal to two x squared. Divide both sides by two, so four is equal to x squared. You get two solutions, x is equal to two and negative two. So that's where the two curves cross. Now I'll make a quick sketch. first curve, y equals 8 minus x squared. That's a parabola facing down with, a y, with an intercept of 8. So it shifted up by 8, facing down. And then the second curve, y equals positive x squared is a parabola facing up at the origin, at the point 0, 0. Okay, and then the two crossing points at negative 2 and positive 2. There's a negative 2, there's a positive 2, but it also goes up to 3, from negative 3 to positive 3 as well. So the, our area is actually three areas. So I'll call it the first area A1, the second area will be called A2, third area we'll call A3. We'll do each area separately. A1 is the integral from A to B of the top function minus the bottom function, dx. Okay, what, what are the endpoints? What are the bounds of this integral? Well, we're going from what x value to what x value? Negative two. Yeah. We're going from negative three to negative two. And what's the top function in that first piece? Right, it's the green one. 
So x squared minus the bottom function is the red one, 8 minus x squared, dx. So that's going to be integral from negative 3 to negative 2 of 2x squared minus 8. Negative negative x squared is positive x squared. x squared plus x squared is 2x squared. You want me to go through this? Or set up the rest of them. Just leave this for you to do. Pain. These negatives, power of 3, e x, all kinds of fractions. I'll, I'll leave it for now. If you want me to go back to it, I will. Okay, now the second area, a2. That's also the integral from a to b of a top function minus a bottom function, but now the top and bottom functions have changed, and a and b have changed. So the top now is the red one, which is 8 minus x squared, and the bottom is now the green one, which is x squared. And the, the bounds, the endpoints, are from negative 2 to 2. So integral. From negative 2 to 2, the top function is 8 minus x squared. The bottom function is x squared dx. And that simplifies. That's the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 8 minus 2x squared. Now I'll do a3. A3 is again integral from A to B of the top function minus the bottom function. You go back to your picture, look at the green one is on top, x squared is on top, the red one's on the bottom. So you have x squared minus 8 minus x squared integrated from, back to the picture, you're going from 2 to 3. That's one thing you could do as well. So I'll just write this down and then go back to that point. 2x squared minus 8. And if you look at this picture, area 1 is equal to area 3. So you could just do this one or this one. I suggest doing this one and you're to do 3. Multiplying that result by 2. And then to make your life even easier, integrate from 0 to 2. You can use. You can do it the straightforward way. You can do all three integrals. It takes more time. Or use the shortcut. There's not a shortcut board. No, I'll do it on here. Here's a shortcut. A1 is equal to A3. And the other, other shortcut is A2 is equal to twice uh, the integral from 0 to 2 of top minus bottom of 8 minus 2x squared. solve this question is to use symmetry to simplify things. Um, what happens, however, if the function is a little bit nastier, instead of 8 minus x squared, what if you had 8 minus 4x minus x squared? It won't be symmetric anymore. If no symmetry to no symmetry to this point, you have to do all three integrals separately, if there's still three of them. You'd have to pick three points, pick three x values, plug it into the function, and then connect it with a parabola shape. It's plus. 
cos sine of theta times the cos of pi over 2 plus sine of pi over 2 times the cosine of theta. What's the cos of 90 degrees? Zero. What's the sine of 90 degrees? One. So you get cos of theta. And you can do the same thing for the other, other four formulas. You can use the double angle formula. Yes, that's, yeah, you could do a graphical proof as well. It's not really a proof, but almost as good. Here's cos of x. And then I'll graph uh, sine of x beside it. Sadly, it actually matters that the picture is not crappy. That's a good picture. And then I want to be a max down there. Go to zero there. Okay, so there's sine of x. And if you shift the argument by pi over 2, shifting the argument of a function shifts the function to the left. So I think the ones that come up the most inside Calc 1000 and Calculus 1301 would be these two, sine of 2x. So there's 2 sine of x, cosine of x. I can't remember if it was 2 marks or 3 marks on the midterm that relied on knowing this identity. And the other one that comes up sometimes is the cos of 2x. And there's three different formulas for this. One of them is cos squared of x minus sine squared of x. Another one is 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. And the third one is 2 cos squared of x minus 1. And all of those are connected through a third trig identity. Sine squared of x plus cos squared of x is equal to 1. And we got that one. We proved that one in class from Pythagorean theorem combined with Sokotoa on, on a unit circle. There's, there's tons of trig identities, though. I think th these are the ones that will get you through. If you're headed to the next calc, the 13 one, you'll need almost all of them. You'll need the double angle, the sine of a plus b, cos of a plus b. You'll need the, the tan secant identity, the cotan cosecant identity. Um, what else? There's so many. There's just there's so, there's so many trig identities that come up there. You can get away here with these, I think. Think. Sine of a plus b. It can come in handy. I'd say yes. I, I don't want to. I'd rather err on the side of caution, knowing that sine of a plus b is sine of a cosine of b plus sine of b cosine of a. I can think of at least one example from the last ten years or knowing this has been required to get perfect on the exam. And it was inside a multiple choice question. Cos? Cos sine of Let me think. Um, 18. Um, 2015. It wants to know what the integral from 0 to 4 of the function, mystery function, evaluated at the root of 4 minus x divided by the root of 4 minus x. It wants to know how to simplify this, how to rewrite this, this function. So we'll do a substitution. We'll 
will attempt to rewrite the question, rewrite the integral in terms of a new variable. And we'll let u equal the square root of 4 minus x and see what happens. So u is equal to 4 minus x to the power of 1 half. When you take the derivative, du by dx, the 1 half will come down. You'll have 4 minus x to 1 half minus 1, which is negative 1 half, multiplied by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 4 minus x is 0 minus 1, so negative 1. And that can be rewritten. du by dx is equal to negative 1 divided by 2 times the root of 4 minus x. Now isolate for dx. dx is equal to negative 2 times the root of 4 minus x times du. Now we're going to use that for a substitution. Okay, but we're not quite ready to substitute yet. There's two more things we have to do. We have to check the bounds. Bounds of integration. We're, we're going to twist the old world into a new world. We're taking a question where the variable is x, where the axis, the horizontal axis is called x. Now we're going to change it to a new, a new world where the horizontal axis is called u. In the old world, we were going from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 4. We want to know what the bounds of integration are on the new horizontal axis, on the u-axis. When x is equal to 0, what is u equal to? u is equal to the root of 4 minus x, so the root of 4 minus 0. So that's going to be root 4, which is 2. And then the, sec and then the upper bound of integration, when x is equal to 4, u is equal to the root of 4 minus 4, which is the root of 0, which is 0. So we'll combine all that together to rewrite this. The top bound was 4, and now it's 0. The bottom bound was 0, and now it's 2. We used to have f of the square root thing. Now we have f of the variable u. Downstairs, we used to have the square root thing. Now we have u. And the dx has been replaced by negative 2 times u times du. Since this piece in here, this square root of 4 minus x, this is also u. Questions to here? Now that the u on the top and the u on the bottom, they cancel. We can bring the negative 2 out front. This is negative 2 times the integral from 2 to 0. OK. So we'll absorb this negative sign into switching the bounds of integration, the order of the bounds. Now the negative is gone, but the 0 and 2 have switched. We have f of u du, and that is one of the options. That's option b. Well, let's do x plus 10. Yes. So you have this as your question. Can we go from 0 to 3 or the root of x plus 10? So what I'll do is I'll let u equal x plus 10, because that's been plugged into the square root function. Um, so our integral is now going to be the square root of u du by dx, what's the derivative of x? 
1 plus the derivative of 10, which is 0. So du is equal to dx. That's a nice thing to substitute. So times du. How about the bounds? x was equal to 0. That means u is equal to x, x plus 10, so 0 plus 10, which is 10. When x is equal to 3, that means u is equal to 3 plus 10. That's going to be 13. So this was integrating from 10 to 13 of the square root of u, which is integral from 10 to 13 of u to the power of 1 half du. That's on your list. That's u to the power of 3 over 2 multiplied by 2 thirds. I just realized I had that recording. This is that, that whole sequence was being recorded of me trying to break into that thing and then noping out of it. Okay, questions to hear? answer would be two-thirds of 13 to the 3 over 2 minus 10 to the 3 over 2 and you just leave it alone there. Don't, don't do anything to it. So what's I recommend it. I recommend changing the bounds. If you don't change the bounds, then at this point here, if you change this view back to what the original function was, that was 10, and then you go back to the old bounds. You go back to the original x axis. switch back x and put the old bound back. Yeah, that's, that's what I know it is, but I saw v back then. But, but you saw one example for that previous, one of the previous ones, this one here, where you had to change the bounds. Right? In order to answer the question, you, you did have to go with the new bounds. Okay, and then the, the first question you had about, is it okay to use the top and bottom power? It, it doesn't really matter. You could do it two different ways. So the, one example is if you had 4 to the 3 over 2, you could write that as 4 to the 1 half all cubed, or you could write that as 4 cubed all to the 1 half. This, in the first case, you get 2 to the power of 3, which is 8. In the second case, you'd get the square root of 64, which is also 8. I, 
I find it easier almost always to apply the you know, lower power version. Power one half of lower power three to make the number smaller. Instead of bigger. What do you want to see next? Okay, 19, 20, 10, it says a wasp population starts with three wasps and it increases at a rate of n prime wasps per day. So this is net change theorem. equals three wasps and increases at n prime of t wasps per day. What is three plus integral from zero to ten of n prime of t dt? Okay, let me rephrase this. This is a question that's phrased for biology. I'm going to rephrase it for not biology. Your bank account, so this is like switching X and Y, same kind of thing. Your bank account has M equals $3, M for money and increases at m prime of t. What is 3 plus the integral from 0 to 10 of m prime of t dt? So m prime of t is saying as a function of time, how much money is being added to the account every day? So m prime of, of 1 would be how much money is being added to the account on day 1. m prime of 2 would be how much money is being added to the account on day 2. So the, what, what is it physically? So what does it represent? So net change theorem says says the integral from a to b of f prime of t dt is equal to f of b minus f of a. If you take the antiderivative of the derivative, these are inverse operations. You get your original function back. Every single time we integrate on balance, we say that the integral of a function evaluated at a to b is the antiderivative of the function evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluate, evaluated at a. And the antiderivative of the derivative is the original function. So integral from a to b of the rate of change of the money, rate of change of, of, of m, that's going to be the amount of money we have at time b minus the amount of money we have at time a. That's our net change in the amount of money. 
So this is amount of money added or subtracted. Depending if it's a positive or negative quantity. By day 10. Is that part okay? Before we go back and answer the question, what, what is the plus? You say integral from 0 to 10, and that kind of PDP would be 10 on 10 minus n of 0. That's how much money we added or subtracted to the account by day 10. Is that okay? So in that case, if we started with 3, 3 plus integral from 0 to 10 of m prime of t dt, this is what we started with. And the second part is how much it changed by. What is that? What we start with plus how much it changed by. So how much money is in your account plus how much you're going to get paid next week. If you don't spend anything, that's going to be how much money is in your bank account, right? So that's the total amount of money equals total amount of money on day 10. Assuming you don't spend anything. Assuming that, well, it, it's, don't assume anything. M prime of T would contain expenses and income. It would be a sum of that. It would contain both, both elements. It's the total, the total change. Revenues minus expenses. So what is this question asking? The biology question. Go back to it. You have wasps. You start with three wasps. And you have a rate, the rate of change of the wasp population. And by integrated from 0 to 10. That's, that second piece is how many extra wasps were added from day 0 to day 10. Then you add the three wasps. So that's going to be your, your total number of wasps after 10 days. Integral from 0 to 1 of the cube root of 8 minus 7x dx. I'm going to rewrite this. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of 8 minus 7x all to the power of 1 third. So we'll convert cube root to a power. It's not on our list. We can convert it into something on our list by doing a substitution. Let u equal what's been plugged into the function. Let u equal 8 minus 7x. So du by dx is equal to negative 7. So dx is equal to minus 1 over 7 times du. And that'll be that'll be what, what we substitute for dx. Our bounds have to change, or they should change. If x is equal to one, then u is equal to eight minus seven times one, so eight minus seven, which is one. So the first bound, the top bound, stays the same. And the bottom bound, if x is zero, then u is equal to eight minus zero which is 8. So our function, or rather our integral, changes its bounds from lower bound being 0 is now lower bound of 8. Lower bound is 1 is still, a, sorry, upper bound of 1 is still an upper bound of 1. And we have u to the 1 third multiplied by negative 1 over 7 du. Questions to here? Okay, and that's going to be negative 1 over 7 times the integral from 8 to 1 
have u to the power 1, 3 du. And I'm using every ounce of self-control to not absorb the negative one in the integral of both the signs. So it's not the signs of your go from 1 to 8 to the negative sign. But I'll leave it, I'll leave it like that. You really don't have to. Okay, antiderivative of u to the one third will be u to the one third plus one divided by one third plus one. And we'll plug in one, plug in eight, and subtract. So one third plus one, that'll be four thirds. So this is gonna be minus one over seven times three over four. We're dividing by four thirds, which is the same as multiplying by three over four, times u to the four thirds, evaluated from eight to one. So that's going to be negative three over twenty-eight times eight to the four thirds. Sorry, one to the four thirds minus eight to the four-thirds. Questions to here. Okay, next. You have three over twenty-eight. One to the power of four-thirds is just one. Eight to the power of four-thirds is eight to the power of one-third, all to the power of four. So that'll be negative three over twenty-eight times one minus two to the power of four. Negative three over twenty-eight times one minus thirty-two, which would be negative thirty-one. No, sorry, that was power five. Uh, two to the four is sixteen, so that'll be negative fifteen. So that's going to be positive forty-five over twenty-eight. Negatives cancel. Questions about any step here? So we'll find y prime. It's a function to the power of a function. So an f to the power of g, and that requires log diff, logarithmic differentiation. It's not an exponential function, and it's not a function raised to a power of a number. So logarithmic differentiation starts by taking the natural log of both sides, natural log of the left side, natural log of the right side, and then requires the use of a property of logs ln of a to the power of c is equal to c times ln of a. The power comes down. So for this function, or for this, this relation, ln y is equal to, the power comes down, ln of x times ln of x. You have not yet taken a derivative. What's written here is exactly equivalent to y is equal to x. There's two ways you can continue from here. One way is exponentiate both sides. So if y is equal to e to the power of the right hand side, I take the derivative of the using um, the method for taking the derivative of exponential functions. So you have the product rule. It's, it's okay to do it that way. Or you can differentiate both sides right now using implicit differentiation on the left and the product rule on the right. So I'll do that way. The derivative of the log of a function is 1 divided by the function multiplied by the derivative of the function. So that's going to be y prime over y. Stealth chain rule. y is a function of x. And on the right hand side we have a product rule. We have the first function, ln of x, multiplied by the derivative of the second, which is 1 over x, plus the second function, ln of x, multiplied by the derivative of the first, which is also 
one over x. Or you could write this as ln of x all squared. And then take the derivative of the 2 and come down. You have ln of x to the power of 1. Multiplied by the derivative of the inside, multiplied by 1 over x. So we get the same thing. So y prime over y is equal to 2 ln of x over x. Now, we want to isolate for y prime. So y prime is equal to y times 2 ln of x all over x. And what's y? y was the original function. It's x times ln of x. x to the power of ln of x, sorry. Multiplied by 2 ln of x over x. And I get the feeling, I'm going to look down the, at the options, and this option is not going to be there. And no, it's not there. So what that means is this is correct. The answer is definitely right. But we have to do some manipulating of this. Let's see. Do they have, any, do they have anything, do they have division by x anywhere? No. Um, they have, what do they do with the 2? Well, the 2 is still in front. That's good. And the lot of x is still in front. So I'm going to start looking at all the options. All the options have a lot of x downstairs. So I'll do that, just because all the options have that. And then we're left with 2 times x to the power of lot of x all over x. And let's see, this is ln of x times, we'll write the division by x, the x on the bottom is x to the power of negative 1, times x to the ln of x. Okay, this is one opportunity to simplify. If you have x to the a times x to the b, exponent law says that's x to the a plus b. So we can use that exponent law down here. That's going to be x to the power of ln of x minus 1. We still have a ln of x in front and a 2 in front. The pi r squared h. So I'll give you the volume formulas that you need. You need cones. I, I don't know. I would really like to, to, to pretend that we would give you the volume, the volume of a cone, but I don't know. It's one third. Yeah. Pi r squared times h. I think for a cone, but I don't know. I don't know. It's. And then for a cylinder, it's pi r squared h. For a sphere, one's four thirds pi r cubed. We derived that in class. And then it's another volume. Oh yeah, cube, um, a box. Length times width times height, a box. Um, not, no, no, area of ellipse would not be. Areas of these shapes would be triangle. Area is one half base times height. A, a uh, rectangle, length times width. Yep, circle. A is pi r squared. Well, you could get an optimization with a volume and related rates with an area and a volume question with another area. Mm. You always need that. 
That's from day one. From, from the first day of class, you, we needed that. Sorry? Lines, straight line, y equals mx plus b. And I think that I think that's all that would be assumed. Circles and lines. Ellipse would have to tell you because they give you the semi-major and semi-minor axis. We'd have to say which one's bigger, which one's smaller. Um, well, there's also sectors of circles. Area of a sector of a circle of angle theta is pi r squared times theta over 2 pi. So that would be, here's a picture of the full circle, and here's the angle theta. Well, so if theta was 2 pi, that's the entire circle, you have 2 pi divided by 2 pi, you get a pi of If theta is 180 degrees, it's pi, then you have half the area of the circle, and you'll have pi over 2 pi, and you'll have half the area of the circle. I guess I, this can be cleaned up a little bit. It's 1 half. R squared theta. I like the other way with the pi r squared times pi times theta over two pi. I like it better because it's it's clearer where it comes from. It comes from taking the percentage the theta divided by two pi is the percent of the circle that you're taking. You cancel the pi's and rearrange it. It just, it just hides where the formula came from. I don't know if there's any other areas. I can't think of any. I mean, like normal area stuff. So half of the circle and four of the circle are contained inside the sector formula. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, circumference. Yep. Two pi r of a circle. Square, well, not square, let's say rectangle. The circumference or perimeter. So perimeter is equal to length times two plus width times two. And triangle would be the same. Okay. How do you think you write this one? Two ways to write it. So we can write it yeah. How would you convert it? So it's going to be an integral from something from A to B of f of x dx. What's delta x? Come here. And over n. We'll assume the a is zero, and then we'll solve the question again, assuming a is pi. To show you that there's more than one way to, to solve these. There's more than one answer. Every single one of these sums can be converted to an, an unlimited number of integrals, depending on what you pick for a. Well, yeah, but as multiple choice, it'll be one of them. Oh yeah, sure. right. So first I'll assume that a is zero. So that means that b minus a over n is a a is so x sub i is equal to a plus i delta x. A is where we start counting the lower bound of integration. We're looking from the area from we're looking the area under the curve from x equal to a. So if we assume that a is 0, then we have b minus 0 is equal to 10. So b is equal to 10. So our integral becomes the integral from 0 to 10 of the function. Well, x sub i is then going to be 0 
plus i times delta x, which is i times 10 over n, so 10i over n. And what's 100i squared over n squared? How does that relate to 10i over n? How are those two related to each other? 100i squared divided by n squared. That's squared is going to be So that thing up there is x sub i squared. So your function would be sine of pi plus x squared dx integrated from 0 to 10. Which, which we can't integrate, but the question doesn't want us to integrate, it just wants us to convert this to an integral. Okay, now we'll do the other assumption. Let's assume that a is pi. Yes. Now, now we'll assume that's pi. So a is equal to pi. Now, what's delta x? Delta x is b minus a over n, which is 10 over n. Now we have b minus pi is equal to 10. So b is equal to 10 plus pi. So our integral will be the integral from pi to 10 plus pi. And now x sub i is pi plus 10i over n. Oh, this is not going to work out so well, is it? Actually, I'm, I'm going to... I, I make it make it so it works out. I made a question that's defective. I'll get rid of the square, just make it 10i over n. And then, okay. So I'll just pretend we started with this, because I want it to work. I didn't want it to be a defective question. So it's 10i over n, 10 over n. Is this okay? Let's go back. Okay, so now, now your question was about x sub i. Was x sub i is always a plus i delta x, whatever we assume for a, that, if that assumption is built into the x sub i. We sub that value of a in there as well. So i plus i times the delta x. The delta x is something that's given to us. It's 10 over n, it's 10 over n, over n. Then you look at the function. It's the sign of that. So f of x sub i is the sine of x sub i. So f of x is the sine of x. So our integral is the integral from pi to 10 plus pi of the sine of x dx. Let's compare these two. If that sum is the same as both of those, then these have to be equal to each other. They must be. How can you prove they're equal? You can do you can do integral. What's another way? Substitute. Let's rewrite this one with a substitution. So let u equal pi plus x. Du by dx is equal to one. Derivative of pi is zero. Derivative of x is one. So du is equal to dx. That means our integral becomes an integral from new bound to new bound of the sine of u du. Let's find what the new bounds are. When x is equal to 0, u is equal to pi plus 0, so u is equal to pi. If x is equal to 10, u is equal to pi plus 10, so that's just pi plus 10. So our, our integral is the integral from pi to pi plus 10 of the sine of u du. That's exactly the same. This integral is the same as that one. So one little lie, it's not really a lie, it's a misleading, is 
the, part of the reason why this process of going from sums to integrals, part of the reason why it's a little bit confusing, is it's not unique. There's more than one way to do it. Of k to the power of i. I shouldn't use k, I should use r. r to the power of i is r times 1 minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r. So if you have the sum, well, as an example, the sum from i equals 1 to n of 2 to the i is 2 times 1 minus 2 to the n divided by negative 1, divided by 1 minus 2. So that would be 2 times 2 to the n minus 1. Another example, if you have the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 half to the i, that can be rewritten as the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 to the i over 2 to the i, and 1 to the i is just 1, which is 1 half times 1 minus 1 half to the n divided by 1 minus a half. The top and bottom cancel. 1 minus a half is a half, so the half and halves cancel. So you'll have 1 minus 1 over 2 to the nth. And then does it stop there or do they simplify it? Oh, they want the limit as n approaches infinity of that. So limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1 over 2 to the i. That's going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus 1 over 2 all to the n. That would be 1 minus 1 over 2 to the infinity, which is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half, which is 0. So you get 1 is 0. How do they do it? Oh, 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 S sub n. Now, that's, that's okay, but we didn't do it that way. I do that in 1301. I do. I write it in that notation in 1301. For Calc 1000, I think we're we're supposed to assume the formula, the geometric series. And uh, do you remember how we did that one in class? How we did the proof of it? I'll, I'll I'll quickly just. I won't do the proof, but we'd say the sum is equal to r to the one plus r squared plus r cubed plus dot 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 plus the last term is r to the n. The second to last term is r to the n minus 1. And then we would multiply the sum by r. We get r squared plus r cubed plus dot 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 plus the last term would be r to the n plus 1. The second last term would be r to the n. And the third last term would be r to the n minus 1. And then we would do um, Let's see, s minus r times s, we'd subtract. On the left, that would give us s bracket 1 minus r equals 2. On the right, we would have r squared minus r squared, those cancel. r cubed minus r cubed, those cancel. r to the n minus 1 cancel with r to the n minus 1. r to the n cancel with r to the n. All the cross terms, or not all the cross terms, all the middle terms cross with all the other middle terms. And we'll have r minus r to the n plus 1. And then you can divide both sides by 1 minus r, common factor out 1 r from the top, and get that formula. If you're stuck on a question like that, try to derive it again from, from scratch. It's one of the places where the proof helps. It helps you remember it. Or, or derive it if you forgot. So have 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 your question list been exhausted or no? Okay, so you'll, you'll probably have more questions on Friday then. Of cos cubed of x times the sine of x dx. Before we integrate this, I'm going to rewrite it as bracket.
cos of x all cubed times the sine of x dx. This looks a little bit more inviting to do a substitution. Because it, it now looks like you have a function plugged into another function. Cos of x is being plugged into the bracket q. And we're, we're going to let u equal cos of x. So du by dx is equal to negative sine of x. So dx is equal to negative du divided by sine of x. And that'll be what we plug in for dx. So this becomes the integral of u cubed, placing cos with u, times sine of x is still there, temporarily, momentarily. dx gets replaced by negative du over sine of x. And now the sine of x cancels top and bottom. And our integral is in terms of entirely new horizontal axis. u cubed times negative du. We bring the negative outside the integral. Integral of u cubed du. Antiderivative of u to the power of 3 is 1 over 4 u to the power of 4 plus c. And then the last step is to replace u with what it was in terms of x. So minus cos to the power of 4 of x, all divided by 4 plus c. sine power of 3, replace it with bracket function to that power. And it's clear that there's a substitution waiting. Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll make one like that. Integral from 0 to pi over 4. So that can be good. Yeah, that's a good one. Pi over 4 is fine. 0 to pi over 4 of cos of x cubed times the sine of x dx. I'll recycle all the substitution stuff we just used. That's going to be the negative integral of u cubed du. Now we have to change the bounds. If x is equal to 0, u is equal to the cosine of 0, since we let u, u equal the cos of x. Cos of 0 is 1. If x is equal to pi over 4, u is equal to the cos of pi over 4, which is 1 over root 2. So our new bounds become 1 to 1 over root 2. So we can take the antiderivative. We would have minus 1 over 4 u to the 4 evaluated from 1 to 1 over root 2. And that would be minus 1 over 4 bracket 1 over root 2 to the power of 4 minus 1 to the power of 4. Minus 1 quarter. 1 over root 2 all squared will be 1 half, and then you're squaring it again, so it'll be 1 quarter. Minus 1. So it'll be negative 1 quarter multiplied by 1 over 4 minus 4 over 4. And that's going to... Oh, so that's going to be minus 1 quarter times negative 3 over 4. Now you multiply them together, the negatives cancel, you get positive 3 over 16 as your answer. Or, if you don't want to change the bounds, you leave it as integral 